Okay, let's look at our objectives. Packet structure. Uh, we have um, an IP datagram is essentially a packet. It's a single packet. Let's look here. This is a program called Ethereal, and actually it's changed its name, and I can't remember what the new name is. Uh, but um, <clears throat> but essentially what this is is a packet analyzer, and it takes packet captures and actually breaks them down to their component parts. So each of these things that you see in here is actually a packet and some of the information associated with this. At time zero, that means at the time that this um, that we start capturing packets, we have a source address, we have a destination address. Here's the protocol and information about this, and uh, hopefully you can look at this and tell what was going on here, but perhaps not. Uh, we'll actually talk about this later, so don't worry about it. Notice that some of the things are color-coded if they're related to each other. And down here we can see that, uh, remember I talked about the encapsulation factor of each packet, is that you have certain things in the application layer which are encased in a TCP, IP la TCP layer, which are encased in an IP layer, and then on down the line into the network layer. Here you have the same thing here, except it's looking at it from, this is the top here. And so, notice that we've got a transmission control protocol layer. This indicates the source port and the destination port. Then we have the internet protocol layer, and the Ethernet 2 layer, and the frame relay layer in here. And so it shows you the encapsulated nature of a packet. And then on down here, uh, let's see if I can show you what this is. You actually see this is actually what you're seeing within the, the data packet. So this is the raw information in the packet. Now what was the point of going there? Let me see. Oh, okay. So here, each of these is a dis discrete piece of information. Uh, TCP IP messages are transmitted using multiple datagrams, and of course that's what you're seeing here, is that this piece of information, notice everything here is going to here, and actually, um, as you'll see, this is actually a, a bad example, because this is actually an attack. This is called a SIN attack, uh, a denial of service attack, something we'll see a little later on. But notice that this computer is trying to communicate with this one, of course in a bad way here. This is an attack that's going on here. Uh, in fact, all this is an attack. Now we see that this computer is responding to the attacker with a reset and an acknowledgement. Let me see if there's any just plain old good packets in here. Uh, no, actually, I think that, that most of these are going to be attacks. They were used for the class last semester. Um, so we saw how the messages are transmitted using multiple datagrams, and they notice that they contain information on the source and the address. Notice at the source right here. We have a destination. And then usually if you've got this, then on the other side of the coin, notice that this is a reply here to this. So you have a you have a source destination. Now the, the destination from here becomes a source and so on. If you look at those two packets, take a look at those. Okay. Notice down here it tells us internet protocol source is this, destination is this. Whoops, okay, and so um, each IP datagram or packet contains information about source and destination, IP addresses, and control settings, as we'll see shortly. Each of these is in a header section, as we'll see, and so this header is divided into different sections. So each IP header structure is part of an IP packet that computers use to communicate, and it plays an important role in terms of network security and intrusion detection. So if we go here, notice this says an IP header structure. Well, there's also a TCP header structure as well, as you will see. There's also a UDP, and there's also a um, ICMP, and so on. So notice that, excuse me. Okay, excuse the interruption. Okay, so uh, notice that the highest, the size of the header goes from zero to 32 bits, and you have um, you have the header version, which is four bits, the header length the type of service, the total length of uh, all the information in here. There's an identification number because um, each of these because needs to know which um, which IP header is being, excuse me, which IP packet is being sent. We have some flags, 
we have a fragment offset, a time to live, uh, the protocol type, and the header checksum. And the header checksum is used to determine whether um, the packet made it successfully uh, from one end to another. And then, of course, you see here you have the source IP address and the destination IP address. So for an IP header, the, there's, this is all important information, but this is the most important information included in here is a source and a destination IP address, each of which is 32 bits. You have the options down here, and then you have data. And so if we flip back over here, let's look at some of this information. Here's the internet protocol. And so notice that this is all header information. Notice that we saw over here that there was a version number. It's version 4. The other internet protocol version is version 6, which isn't used much right now. It tells you the header length. Let's go back over here. There that is. See? OK. Uh, the differentiated field services, the total length of the header is 40. The identification number is this in hex, which translates to this in decimal. We have the flags. The only one used here is don't offset. The fragment offset is 0, which means this is not fragmented. Time to live is 64. And if you recall what that is, think for a second. That's used to make sure that, um, that a packet isn't bounced around the internet forever. Each time a uh, packet hits a router, the, the time to live is decremented by 1, which means that once it hits um, 64 different routers, that it uh, on that at that point in time this time to live is zero and so it will or excuse me it should be one and the uh, the router will know that the time to live for the next one would be zero so it's actually just discarded. The protocol type is TCP. Notice that it says this in here, but also we know it from down here. The header checksum. Notice that it says this is a checksum and it's correct. And the source and destination address. You wonder well where's all the where's all the data? Well. This is actually considered data in here because notice that this is actually encapsulated within the IP. Okay, let's go back uh, here. Okay. Ah, okay, and that's it in Ethereal. Of course, we've got a got a lot better look at it live. Okay, keep keep on looking at the IP packet structure. Uh, IP data uh, is used for firewalls, virtual private networks, and proxy servers, and they're used to protect data in a packet. For example, you know, you ask yourself, well, what, what, what IP data information could be used in here? Well, there's lots of information. At the IP level, a couple of the things, important things are, um, actually the most important thing is the source and destination address. You can create firewall rules or, or uh, access control in uh, proxy servers or virtual private networks, which actually control what happens when a particular source or a particular destination address is seen by the firewall or the VPN or the proxy server. So that's very important information that can be used for each of those layers of defense. IP fragmentation. Uh, sometimes you have packets that are much larger than can be handled by a network. So what happens is, is the router will break something up into varying fragments. And essentially what this means is, um, is when you fragment a packet it allows larger packets to pass through routers and so the routers divide the packets into multiple fragments and then send them along the network however it can create security problems and we'll learn much 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 more about this later but just, just suffice to say right now what you can do is, is you can have software that has overlapping packets and actually actually um, allow uh, attack packets through your firewall uh, because of the fragmentation. And they can do other things as well, but let's just keep it basic for right now. Okay, ICMP. Internet Control Message Protocol. What is this known as? It's known as the ping. I think we're all familiar with that. And so, when we go here, that's not what I wanted to do. I just wanted to show something simple, and I'm sure you all know this already, so bear with me. If you don't know, go away. There we go. And so let's ping. Okay, you're seeing what's happening here. We're pinging. Essentially, what we're doing is we're sending an ICMP, an ICMP packet to this address right here. 32 bytes of data. Notice that th this computer is replying with 32 bytes of data. It took less than a millisecond to reach it and return. And the time to live is 64. We've already described what that is. And so ICMP 
Packets were created as a way to troubleshoot communication problems in networks. I'm sure a lot of you, if you've ever set up a network, you know if you want to see if you're connected to another computer or if you can see another computer, you send a ping packet to it. And so um, it's good if, when used by system administrators to let um, to let an administrator know whether a host is alive or not, but also it lets intruders know whether a host is alive or not. So how do you get around that so it can be used for good or for evil? What we'll see later when we start looking at um, packet filtering and firewalls is that um, is that we can use these to actually filter ICMP messages. For example, um, by filtering that means we we limit access to whether an ICMP MP packet can be sent from our network or to be received from outside our network. If you think about it, um, sometimes you might want to open up, let's say, um, a particular um, port. Uh, excuse me, uh, allow a particular IP address outside of our uh, network to be able to get in and ping computers within our protected network just let's say because of uh, an assistant administrator needs remote access to computers and needs to be able to determine whether their computers within a, a protected network are open or not, or up or not. Okay, there's actually many different types of ICMP codes. Um, Notice the two here, echo request and echo reply. Those are used with an ICMP packet to indicate that to an, an echo request is that it, which is essentially the ping that we sent before, and echo reply is the return reply saying that yes, I'm up, and so on. Um, destination unreachable is used when a host on a particular network can't be contacted, and so the, um, the router sends back the information that that destination is unreachable, and if you ever put together a network, you've probably seen these types of messages. Source quench means that, that the computer that's sending them the computers that are receiving the information is receiving too much information too quickly and it's that is it's a TCP IP window uh, can't handle the uh, the speed with which it's receiving the information so it's telling the sending computer to slow down. Um, some of the other ones are um, redirect to a different route because there's a faster route located in the routing tables destination network unknown if a network can't be found or in destination host, host unknown if it can't be found either. Notice time to live exceeded right here, there's too many hops in a destination and so on. Okay, TCP headers. Oh and by the way, why did, why did we include ICMP at the IP level? That's because that's that's where that lives, that's where it's classified as is at the IP level because you're only dealing with IP addresses and not ports. Okay, the TCP level. Uh, now what we're talking about is not only an IP address but also a port number associated with a packet. Um, and the flags are important from a security standpoint as we'll see later because based upon the flags, and I don't know if you can't remember what these are, there's ur URG or U for urgent, A for acknowledgement, P for push, RST for reset, SIN for synchronize or synchronous numbers and for finishing. If we look over here, we can see all the different flags that are listed in here. Here you have a SYN, a SYNAC, and an ACK. If you'll recall what this is, what is this computer trying to do? This computer is trying to this computer is trying to connect with that computer. This computer, the receiving computer, responds, yes, let's synchronize, acknowledge, and finally this last acknowledgement means that you have a three-way handshake between this computer and that computer. And so that's that's something that you'll you'll um, see when we start talking about firewalls is that those kinds of flags are important. Notice that you have the fin and the ack right here indicating that we're breaking down a connection between the computers. And so when we start creating our firewalls, you'll be very interested in looking at the flags that are set on the TCP headers that are coming in because based upon those flags will determine whether you want a packet to enter your network or leave your network or not. Here's our TCP header. So notice that we have our source port and our destination port. We have our sequence number. Remember this is a reliable communications protocol and so we have to have some way of actually um, putting the sequence of packets back in order because they may not arrive at the same time. And so we'll need a sequence number. We also have an acknowledgement number so that we can make sure that um, 
if a packet is not received or if a packet is damaged that one computer can send back the packet or indicate that a packet a damaged packet was received reserve notice that here's our flag so this is going to be a 01010101010101 zero, one, zero, one, zero, one, zero, one, zero, one, zero, one as our binary and so if we think about on our initial three-way handshake what are these which one of these are going to be set just the sin on the second stage of the three-way handshake what's going to be set the ac and the sin got it okay window is the amount of t uh, space available for the remaining packets coming through there's a checksum the urgent pointer and then there's options and padding down here let's go back here and take a look So here's our trans this is our layer here, transmission control protocol, the source port, the destination port. Okay. What does this destination mean? Haiti. Well, sorry. Yeah, HTTP web. Yeah, that was pretty easy. Let's go look at this one. There. So we have our source port. And notice that this is over um, over um, if you notice that this is uh, greater than 1023, uh, all ports below 1024, that is 0 to 1023, are called reserved or well-known ports, and those are usually reserved for um, for um, well uh, well-known applications and things that are being run by root or the administrator. And of course, 80 is one of those. And so, notice that 80 is a well-known port, and it's reserved in HTTP. Is usually run on port 80. Notice that there's a sequence of zero, sequence number, and a length number. Um, and that's important because notice that this is a send packet, and so there's really no data to be set up until there's a three way handshake sent. So this, it's, it starts out at zero, and there's nothing, no data involved, so it's a length zero. If we move down here, let me see. Notice that the flags are set as the sin flag, and notice these are all zero except the sin here set to one, so that indicates that's the only one set. Window size is zero, the checksum is correct, and let's see what the options are. Is not really anything. Okay. Notice that this is a relative sequence number um, right here, as you'll see later on. There's also an absolute one, which is going to be um, larger than that, larger than zero. Okay, now looking still within the TCP, I, TCP layer is uh, we look at UDP headers. Remember, this is connectionless. And so, um, unlike, and it's un considered unreliable because of that. So, it's essentially like throwing information um, at somebody and not caring whether it receives them or not. It just hopefully it will be received, but you never know th this, whether it's received or not. And there's actually quite good uses for this. So UDP provides a datagram transport service for IP, and it's considered unreliable because it's connectionless. That is, it's not like a phone. It, um, you know, a phone call, you, you can each talk at the same time, and you can receive information. You can hear the other person. Um, whereas, let's say, um, if I'm sending, if I'm going to watch a, show somebody a video um, over the internet, because of the the um, the amount of data that's crossing the internet, we don't want to have communications back and forth between the two sources. We just want one source to listen to the other, and therefore you would use UD packets for something like that. It's not a very good explanation, but uh, that's the best I can do right now. So attacker, uh, attackers can scan for open UDP services, and we'll see how to do that later on. I'll teach you how to do all this stuff. It's not that hard to do. And UDP packets have their own headers that are distinct from TCP, and this all there is. So why did you have all this information for here, and you don't have for over here? Well, all this stuff is actually setting up the connections into making everything reliable. You know, the checksum, the flags, the acknowledgement number, and the sequence number, these are all important for setting up something that's reliable. That means that if something is lost or something is damaged, that it ensures that that information is sent or received again in the appropriate fashion. Whereas here, all we've got is a source port, destination port, the link, the checksum, and data. And so there's no way to make this uh, reliable. OK, now what are we talking about? We're talking up to the application layer, which is the topmost layer under the TCP IP model. 
So what are what is the domain name service? I'm sure you've heard about that. What that does is it translates fully qualified domains to IP addresses because computers don't don't talk to each other via um, human um, human like language. They talk to each other with numbers. And so when I want to go to www.microsoft.com, is that when I type that up into my um, Let's look at an example of how this works. I'm trying to. Uh, so what I've done is I've, I've gone and I've set up my. There it is. So I've set up Ethereal to actually capture things over the network. Essentially, what I'm doing is I'm sniffing the network. And so um, notice that all the things, all the different uh, communications that are occurring just because I open this web address. Okay, let's go. Uh, let's go here just for a second. What I'm going to do is. Oops. I'm going to go to Microsoft.com. There we go. And so essentially when I do that, my, my computer has to go out and say, well, I need the IP address for Microsoft.com. That goes out to a domain name server. And it, uh, in that domain name server, there's a mapping between Microsoft.com and the appropriate IP address. It sends it back to this computer. And then the application actually uses that IP address to communicate with Microsoft.com. Let's see what that looks like in here. Stop. Okay. Um, here we go. Now let's go back and we'll close this. We'll stop this. There we go. Okay. Notice that here, um, here's a DNS query for Google. Okay. And so notice that that under this is a user datagram protocol. So the DNS actually uses UDP rather than TCP. And if we move down here, queries. Notice that this is saying mail.google.com. Come on. There we go. There. There. So type A, host name, and then somewhere in here there should be its notice this is a standard query standard query response so the DNS server actually replied to this okay and so here's the answer there we go and so google.com mail is that this gives us uh, the IP addresses associated with it so what we've done is, is that we've requested an IP address for mail.google.com and we've gotten several answers right here in the authoritative name servers are the uh, DNS servers that that uh, hold the um, the IP addresses here? I mean, there there could be any DNS server can hold these addresses, but this is one called the authoritative one. We'll talk more about that later on. That's the one that's in charge of of keeping a correct list of these, which can then be translated to other domain name servers. So DNS can be used to block unwanted communications. Administrators can block websites containing offensive content by taking the, uh, the information out of DNS. And as we'll see later on, there's different types of attacks that can occur with respect to DNS, including buffer overflows, zone transfers, and cache poisoning. It's not important to know what those are right now, but later on we'll know more about them. Encryption. Why do we use encryption? Encryption essentially is concealing information to render it unreadable by those who should not be reading it. That is, only the intended recipients of the information should be able to read it. As we'll see later on, there's different types of encryption. We have asymmetric encryption and symmetric encryption, and they differ greatly in how they work and how they function. And then we have some forms of um, encryption modes that actually combine the two. And actually, you use encryption every day if you use the computer. Uh, you just don't realize that you're using it. So firewalls often encrypt data, leaving the network and and decrypt incoming packets. For example, within a uh, VPN, I mean firewalls really don't. That's not really exactly accurate. Firewalls don't usually do that, but other um, other uh, applications do that. Encryption can often make use of digital certificates, which are used to authenticate a sender, and that uses public-private key encryption. We'll talk about later. A digital certificate is an electronic document containing encryption keys and a digital signature. A digital signature is something that allows you to indicate, uh, to sign something so that somebody can't come back later and say, 
Uh, well, I didn't sign that. If you signed it with your digital signature, then that's just the same as signing it with your uh, handwriting, writing your name. And also, we'll, later on, we'll talk a little bit about public key infrastructures, which makes it possible to distribute certificates because, um, as we'll see, some of the problems with symmetric key encryption are key management. Um, and uh, using a public key infrastructure makes it very, very easy to actually administer and manage uh, public keys. Okay. Okay, we're going to stop there for right now, and we will finish this up uh, later this week. Go ahead and make sure that um, if you do have the book, go ahead and read the first chapter. If you don't, go ahead and look through these notes and listen to my recordings. And then uh, you'll get this next, um, the next iClass later this week.